watching over my soul, my soul to keep guarding over me ever, watching wherever I go. When the winds blow, He is my shelter. When I'm lost and alone, He rescues me. And when the lion comes, he is my victory, constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. We are His children and He is our Father, watching over our soul. Great is His love for His sons and His daughters, watching wherever we go. When I'm lost and alone, He rescues me. And when the lion comes, He is my victory, constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. If you are one of our guests, we are honored that you've uh, chosen to come out and be here today. There's a card on the seat in front of you, and if you're a guest, you can fill that out and place that on the collection plate when it passes in just a little bit. And uh, if you have a prayer request, indicate that on the card, and we'll be praying about those things this week. We're just really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. Uh, a lot of really good things have been happening at Twickenham this past week. I just want to cover some family news with you as we begin this morning. Uh, one, of the, one of the big things that happened this week was our annual trunk or treat. We, we usually meet up in the parking lot and we open up or decorate our cars and we have all kind of stuff going on and we, kids from all over the neighborhood come and this past Wednesday night, the weather was just awful. So we moved it into the gym. We had hundreds of people in the gym and that flexibility was it was inevitable. We just did a great, you guys did a great job coming through with that, and we had a really good time. There's some of our folks. One of our elders came in character, dressed up as, as uh, the Grouch from Sesame Street. So, Oscar the Grouch from Sesame Street. So, it was a good week. Thank you for, for your work in that. You did, you did a good job on that. And then uh, Friday night, we had our prayer service, our annual prayer service from noon until midnight on Friday. And these are the prayer cards. These are stories of what's going on in people's lives and what they are inviting God into. And so many folks came by throughout the day. Uh, we haven't had people coming in, coming in uh, at 10 o'clock that morning, two hours before it actually began and praying. And those cards were all over the stage up here. Uh, you should just come by sometime and take a look at some of these. They're powerful testimonies, uh, a lot of pain, a lot of hope about what's going on. So a lot of really neat things happened this week, and uh, we're, we're grateful to you for being a part of that. And then next Sunday, we will be uh, handing out our, what we call our second harvest sacks. Uh, and these are grocery bags, and you'll pick up two, and you'll fill those up with the, the itemized list that are attached to the grocery bags and bring them back here. And then the Saturday before Thanksgiving, we will be bringing folks into our building here, and we'll give hundreds of families a Thanksgiving meal that will include a ham or a turkey, and then all the stuff that you put in those sacks. We do this every year. It's a huge event. We'll need a lot of volunteers on that Saturday morning, but we need you to be sure and pick up those bags next week, take them to the grocery store, fill them up, and then bring them back here to the building so that we can be prepared to serve the people in our community. So a lot of really neat things have been going on this past week, and, and we're glad that you're a part of that. But not everything that happened this past week was, was good. Um, well, not everything that happened this week was pleasant and enjoyable. There is a, a ministry in town called Huntsville Inner City Learning Center, uh, and we call it HSCLC for short, and uh, it's, a, it's a powerful ministry uh, for children and families in the inner city of Huntsville. And they've been there for years. They do incredible work. Kids that go through HICLC do better in school. Um, they, just, they just perform better in every arena of their lives. And it's been a, a huge blessing. The, the, the man behind that vision 
and the leader and founder of that organization is named Art Leslie. And Wednesday night at our trunk or treat, Art was here. He was wearing a pair of pressed overalls. He could make overalls look good. Uh, and uh, he was here with some of his kids uh, from HSCLC, and he just was having a great time. And then on Thursday, uh, Art suffered a brain aneurysm, and he went into the hospital, and then sometime on Friday, Art passed away. And our hearts are broken because he was important to HSCLC, and he was important to this church, uh, and important to so many children in this city. And so if there's a little bit of a heavy air this morning in, at Twickenham, it's because we rejoice that Art has gone to be with his father, but we are hurt deeply that he has gone away from us. Uh, Todd or his daughters in the, the house this morning, uh, his daughters are here this morning, uh, Colette, Lakita, Rose, and Tori. And can you guys just stand so we can acknowledge you and give you a hand and let you know that we are with you and we love you. And, and that we love your dad. Todd White is one of our shepherds. He is also uh, on the board of Huntsville Inner City Learning Center. And we've asked Todd if he would to come this morning and lead us in a prayer as we begin. So let's bow together as Todd leads us. And we'll pray in gratitude for art, support for his family and friends, and for the ongoing mission of Huntsville <coughs> Inner City Learning Center. pretty good. Father, we praise you this morning, as we always do. Uh, we're so grateful for your grace and your mercy and your love. And it's especially in times like this, when, when we're hurting, uh, that we lean on you and we lean into you. Uh, thank you this morning for the life of our brother, Art Leslie, and for uh, just the way that you worked through him. I thank you for the way that he pointed us to you, and for the lives that he touched, for the vision that you gave him. And Father, we're thankful that he's home with you today. And yet in the midst of that, we, uh, we are struggling with the grief and with the hole that he has left. So we pray this morning that you would give us the peace that passes all understanding. That, Father, you'd give us the wisdom to know how to move forward. We pray for his family. We pray for friends. We pray for loved ones who are suffering this morning in, in loss. We pray for the Learning Center in particular. I pray for the, uh, for the staff that will meet later this afternoon and for the board. Pray for the children who will show up tomorrow. And I pray for the, for the folks who will meet them and will help to walk through this with them. I pray for the staff and for all the volunteers there. And I pray for this church, for Twickenham and for what we've lost. And Father, we lean on you. Uh, we rejoice this morning because our joy does not come from our circumstances, but it comes from you and from the hope that you give. And so as we worship today, we pray that you hear our voices and that you mend our hearts and that you bless us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Todd. Somebody mentioned to me yesterday, and I, they didn't even know what we were going to be doing this morning, our Focus this morning is on our relationship with God as our Father. We're beginning a series on prayer, and this morning we'll be talking about God as our Father. And somebody said yesterday, you know, Art was a father to a lot of kids, which is just a, a powerful testimony to his work. I want to begin this morning with a video uh, that depicts how important it is to have somebody you can call dad, somebody you can call mom, how important it is to... to have 
people that you know love you and care about you. So watch this video, and then we'll get right into our worship service. is a typical afternoon at Ashley and Alo Moley's house. But it wasn't always like this. The Moleys were married in 2013 and had dreams of starting a big family. We just wanted a huge family. Me in particular, I just wanted to have a football team of my own. Then came the heartbreaking news. Ashley suffered from a medical condition that doctors said could prevent her from getting pregnant. It was devastating. You know, as a husband, you uh, you know, he's just don't know what to do, you know, because you're just always wanting to give your wife everything that she ever wants, and uh, when her body wouldn't allow it, uh, that's, that's something that's out of our control. Still, determined to have children, Ashley and Allo started talking about adoption or becoming foster parents. What if we could help these kids that come from not-so-good situations and show them what a family should be? They soon learned there were six siblings, four of them with special needs, and they all needed a home. But six children at one time seemed like a lot. But to take in all six, I really had to do some soul searching to see if that was something I was willing to do. I said, we either take all of them or we take none of them, because I don't think I could make that choice and say, you know what, split up this family. When we grew up, saying family is the, the biggest thing. And with that, Michael, Brittany, Nicholas, Brianna, JT, and Ty came into their lives as their new foster children. It was awesome. It was something that you've always dreamed of. I mean, when you're little, you play with baby dolls and you're the mom and you want to take care of them and hold them and make sure they're okay and that they feel safe and comfortable. Why do you like to have a lot of brothers and sisters? Love. They just made it so comfortable. Like, they made sure that their home was our home. And although they were a foster family, the children took it upon themselves to start calling Ashley and Aloe mom and dad. I come running down, and I'm like, did you just call me dad? So like, yeah, dad. I need help with my homework, and that's when it was all worth it. The hospital visits, the, uh, the nights of crying, and, you know, just telling my wife. All those times that we'd waited... You know, they called us mom and dad. That's when everything was okay. But there was still one more hurdle, making it permanent and adopting the children. I don't want to just be here for a short run. I want to be here for the long run. Let's stand. As your children gather in peace, all the angels sing in heaven. In your temple, all that I see is to bless your holy presence. All the heavens cannot hold you, Lord. How much less to dwell
passages are from Galatians 3 this morning. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King of all peace. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King of all this is amazing grace. This is amazing love. This is amazing love. That you would take my place. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. No has seen and no ear has heard and no mind has ever conceived the glorious thing that you have prepared for everyone who has believed. You brought us here and you called us your own and made us join hands with your Son. How high and how wide, how deep and how long, how sweet and how strong is your love. Your grace, how faithful your ways, how great is your love, O oh Lord. Objects of mercy who should have no wrath, we're filled with unspeakable joy. Riches of wisdom. 
some unsearchable wealth and the wonder of knowing your voice. You are our treasure and our great reward, our hope and our glorious King. How high and how wide, how deep and how long, how sweet and how strong is your love. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Be seated as we take our offering. You unravel me. With a melody, you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Now I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am
Good morning. For those of you that don't know, Jody and I, uh, we go way back to his Atlanta days. He was actually the one to hire me and give me my first job out of college. So uh, for that, um, I'll always be thankful. But uh, as a result of that, we kind of have a relationship where we poke fun at each other at each other's expense, right? We tell jokes and, um, and it's all in good fun. So when Jody called me and asked me to do communion thoughts on Romans 8, I thought it was a joke at first, right? Because in case you didn't know, Romans 8, it talks about the Holy Spirit, justification, and predestination. Uh, three super easy and non-controversial topics at all. So, um, <clears throat> but sure enough, he was actually serious. And so if you have any complaints about anything I say today, uh, you can direct them to Jody at Twickenham.org or you can call the hotline at 678-613-3961. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but all joking aside, when I was two, uh, I flew from Korea to Dulles International Airport in Washington, D.C. Uh, to meet and live with who would eventually become my new family. While there are plenty of pictures to document this event, I was a bit too young to remember it. But as I think about what must have been going on through my mind and what I was feeling, the primary emotion would have had to have been fear. Here I am, being uprooted from everything I know, taken to a strange land, and being forced to live with people whom I've never met before. While I wasn't exactly leaving a great situation in Korea, the situation that I was leaving was familiar and comfortable. And here's the thing, we all have faced times where we are forced to leave the familiar and comfortable and are forced to stare fear in the face. Sometimes that could be moving to a new city or starting a new job, or maybe facing a new phase in your life. Whatever it is, it is in these times that we often grow the most. When we face struggles and overcome them, we become better people as a result. Often, we need to go through bad times to reach the good times. And Romans 8 speaks to this a bit. Starting at verse 15, it says, So you have not received the spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But, but if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. What does that mean for us? What does it mean to share in his suffering? We've already established that you have to go through the bad times to reach the good. And that was true for Christ as well. You see, Christ had to go through and endure the cross. He, the shame, the humility, the torturous death, the pain of taking on all of our sins. He endured all that suffering so that we could be adopted into his family and share in his glory. God had to endure the bad to get to the good of being able to adopt us into his family and call us his children. I started with a story about me meeting my new family at the Dulles International Airport and the fear that I must have felt. Knowing what I know now, I had nothing to fear, but it is this experience of being adopted that gives me a unique perspective of what it means to be an adopted son and getting all the same privileges as my siblings. But not only that, growing up, I also got to witness all that my family had to sacrifice to be able to give me those blessings. If you continue on in verse 31 of Romans 8, it states, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? You see, God, he gave up everything to give us everything. He went through the bad to get to the good so that we could call him father. Let's pray as we remember this sacrifice that God made for our sake. Father God, we, we come to you and we praise you. 
we are so thankful for your suffering that you endured so that we may call you Father. We are, um, help us to remember that uh, in this time of communion. And I pray all this in your son's name. Princes and paupers, sons and daughters, kneel at the throne of praise. Losers and winners, saints and sinners, one day will see his face. And we God, we, we do bow down and we do worship you and we are thankful for the blood that you shed um, so that we may call you Abba Father. And I pray all this in your son's name.
summer and winter, the mountains and the rivers, whisper the Savior's name. Awesome and holy, the friend to the lonely, forever his love will reign, and we all bow down. Kings will surrender their crowns and worship Jesus, for he is the love, unfailing love, he is the love of God, he's the light of the world, and Lord Hey, so a couple of, uh, one more, two more things. One, this Wednesday night, uh, we'll be having our instrumental service here in the auditorium, the spring, which is going to be, it's aptly named because it's getting cold out, so in the fall, so you come join us here, 6.30 for the spring. And then after this service today, one of our small groups is hosting a lunch for, pardon me? Oh, got you. Okay, one of our small groups is hosting a, a lunch for, if you're a guest today, and you don't have lunch plans, go downstairs uh, into the fellowship hall. One of our small groups is going to host lunch for you down there. Kind of neat. So join them if you can. I want to begin with some questions. Uh, One of the things that we have learned in our vision process, which is still unfolding, and you'll be hearing some more about that in the next couple of weeks, is that one of the things we've learned is that questions are more transformative than answers. Answers are good, and we need answers. But questions have a way of inviting honesty and inspiring creativity and opening us up to change. So let me ask some questions about prayer. Do you ever wonder if when you pray... If your prayer is not much more than helpful psychological self-talk, like when you organize the chaos in your head, which is a good thing, speaking things out loud, organizing that chaos into words and sentences and paragraphs is really helpful, but when you say those words out loud, when you pour out the yearnings of your heart, do you ever feel like the only thing that heard it was the four walls and the floor and the ceiling of the room in which you're praying? Have you ever driven to work or to school and said a prayer on the way, and then you pull into the parking spot, put the car in park, turn off the ignition, and then you've get the soul sick sense that the prayer you prayed on the way to work or school splashed against the inside of the windshield, kind of the way a bug splashes against the outside. And then next weekend when you go to clean up the car and you Windex the glass, the residue of your prayers will run down the windshield in tiny rivulets of blue liquid until you wipe them off with a paper towel. You ever feel like your prayers are the proverbial tree in the forest that falls and nobody's listening? Some of you will hear those questions and your answer will be a resounding 
No, I never feel that way. And that's because you have mastered the biblical command and discipline and art of praying without ceasing. I know there are people in the room for whom prayer is on your every breath. Look at this. These are people who believe in prayer. And those of you who came for our Friday prayer service, you took these cards and for hours you wept over them and you prayed over them because that's your first language. You speak prayer. Every breath is a prayer for you. You have embraced your helplessness and you have turned that over to God and you're entirely okay with that. You're entirely okay with admitting I can't control anything, everything is the Lord's, every moment of my life is dedicated to Him. Even when I'm not speaking, my heart is prayerful to God. I know that's where some of you are. There may be a time in the past when you didn't know how to pray, but that was so long ago. It's almost like a character you read about in a novel, not a life that you lived and a memory that you made because prayer is so much a part of your life. I know there are people like that in the room. So when I ask those questions, you're like, not me, no. And then there are, there's another group in the room, a smaller group to be sure, but there's another group that would answer, no, we don't ever feel those things, but for an entirely different reason. You'd say, no, I don't struggle with those feelings because I don't pray. I don't believe in prayer. In fact, I think it's kind of unhealthy, crazy even, to talk to some invisible being who never responds because he wasn't there to begin with. Now, if that's where you are, can I just tell you how impressed I am that you're here? Thank you. And I mean that sincerely. I think it takes an enormous amount of courage and open-mindedness to put yourself in an environment where you know you're going to disagree with things that other people say. There's not enough of that going around these days. So you're here, incredible. So good. But like I said, we think questions are, the, are a way of opening up new possibilities. So I hope you at least find it refreshing that we're willing to ask really hard questions like that. And maybe by asking them with us, you will open up to some new possibilities for yourself, like maybe there really is someone there listening. So some of us can't, cannot imagine not praying, and some of us think prayer is as imaginary as unicorns and leprechauns, and then right in the middle is the rest of us. And maybe you're there in the middle. And you, you believe in God, and you know that prayer is commanded, but you struggle with it. And maybe the reason you struggle, I think we're often trying to make things a lot deeper and harder than they are. Maybe the, thing, maybe the reason you struggle with prayer is it's just a discipline issue for you. You're just not disciplined in that area of your life. And what you need to work on is getting more discipline. You need to get in, back into the habit of praying, back into the discipline of praying. And maybe by our just talking about it for the next several weeks, that will encourage you and inspire you to get back on your knees and start talking to God again. So maybe, maybe it's just a, that kind of issue, or maybe it's, it is a little deeper. Maybe you struggle with prayer because when you pray, it doesn't seem like anything changes. And you're afraid if you keep on praying and nothing keeps on happening, you'll lose your faith altogether. You've lost the nerve to pray. So we're beginning this series this morning. Just ask, finding the nerve to pray. Maybe I should have said finding the nerve to pray again. There's a story in Luke 11 where, where Jesus uh, is praying and when he finishes, one of his disciples comes up and says, Lord, teach us to pray. They, they saw something in the way he prayed that they wanted. Even though he did not always get what he wanted, and I want to be sure you heard that, Jesus didn't always get what he wanted when he prayed. But even though he, he, he didn't always get what he wanted, he never stopped talking to God, never stopped talking to his Father. They saw that and they said, Lord, 
teach us how to do what you do. Teach us to, com- to communicate with God that way. And so I, I want to follow their example, and I want to go to Jesus and see what we can learn. We're going to spend our time in the next several weeks in uh, just five verses in the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 6. If you're, it's on your device, it's easy enough to find. Uh, if you're looking at a hard copy Bible, Matthew's the first book of the New Testament. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John it might be better served to go to the back of the Bible and back up to it. The last book of the Bible is called Concordance. If you just back up, some of your Bibles have maps as the last book. Back up to Matthew. It'll be about three quarters of the way through the Bible. This is an amazing passage. We're in Matthew chapter 6. This is an amazing passage. It's incredibly brief. You could tweet it and still have room left over for some more characters. You could put it on a coffee mug or a t-shirt, but its breadth and depth are just staggering. I mean, this five-verse prayer touches themes as grand as God's hallowed name and God's eternal kingdom and human forgiveness, and then it talks about bread and debt and temptation. It's amazing. So it seems appropriate, since we're going to read this passage where Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, it seems appropriate that we would begin with prayer, right? So I'm gonna, we're going to put the Lord's Prayer up on the screen in just a few minutes, because you may know it, you may know parts of it, you may know it from a different version, so we'll at least all be singing off the same page here. Uh, we're going we're gonna to pray this prayer. I'm going to pray a couple of other things first, and then I'll invite you to join me and pray out loud with me. Like they did in Acts chapter 6, they'll all, we'll all raise our voices together in prayer to God using the Lord's Prayer. So let's bow. I'll pray about a couple of things first and then we'll, we'll get to that. Holy Father, we come to you this morning so grateful that you teach us how to talk to you. That you know that we don't know how. And you have taught us through the life and message of Jesus. And we're grateful that here in the United States, while we feel a little pressure, we are never persecuted because we want to talk to you. But today we join with the voices of millions of other Christians praying for persecuted Christians in other countries where simply saying our Father brings the wrath of the government down on them. Simply acknowledging that there is a God brings the wrath of persecutors down on them. And so, Father, we today join millions of Christians praying for those who are persecuted, asking you to deliver, to heal, and that your kingdom would come in their behalf. Much closer to home, we we lift up this morning the Church of the Highlands. We ask you to bless our brothers and sisters there as they meet this morning. We pray that lives will continue to be changed through their ministry that you will protect them, guide them, and that they will be effective messengers of the message of Jesus. Now, Father, as we all join our voices together, praying the prayer Jesus taught us, we say together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And other versions will say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks. So there's one word in Jesus' prayer here that can radically change how you think about God. It can radically change how you think about prayer. I'll mention that. I'll tell you about that word in just a moment. But first, I want you to take a look at this. This is a, a picture of very, perhaps the most recognizable building, one of the most recognizable buildings in the world. It wasn't always called the White House. 1901, before 1901, it was usually called the Executive Mansion. But every state had an Executive Mansion for its governor, and so President Theodore Roosevelt believed that officially naming it the White House would set it apart from all the others. So you know you're dealing with somebody important, right? If their house is named. I don't know about your house, but my house isn't named. 
It's the house at 610 Indian Lake Drive. Now you know where I live. Thanks to Jason, you know my phone number and my email address. <laughs> Kid was actually one of the best hires we ever made. I kind of wish he was working for us right now so I could fire him, but that's another story, all right? <laughs> so you know you're important if your house is named, but it's not just the house that's named. The rooms in the White House are named. There's the blue room, the green room, the yellow room, the red room, the vermeil room. I don't even know what that is. Is that a color, a flavor, a texture? What is that? The vermeil room, there's the Lincoln bedroom, the situation room, of course, the oval office. So if your house is named, you're a pretty important person. But if the rooms in your house are named, you must be really important. But it's not just the rooms that are named. The furniture is named. This is a picture of the Resolute Desk. It sits in the Oval Office. It's been used by several United States presidents. It was a gift from Queen Victoria to President Rutherford B. Hayes in 1880. And it was built from timbers taken from a British ship that got stuck in the Arctic ice and abandoned in 1854. Turn to your neighbor and tell him the name of that, that British ship. Go ahead and do that right now. Go ahead. Okay, if you said anything other than the resolute, you need to go to remedial church, okay? <laughs> Name of the desk is the resolute desk taken from a ship called the resolute. How, must, how important must you be if, the, if your house and the rooms in your house and the furniture in the rooms in your house are all named? What do you call the person? who lives in that house and walks those rooms and sits at a desk that has a name and a history? How do you relate to a person who, when he or she walks into a room, everybody stands up and they play a song? Here's the most important or one of the most important, it's up there, okay? One of the top two most important things I'll tell you this morning. The answer to the question, how do you relate to, how do you address a person of that importance depends upon your connection to that person. It depends upon your relationship, your relationship, your relationship to that person. See, most of us would call the person who sits behind the resolute desk Mr. or Madam President. So take a look at this picture. That's a picture of John Kennedy Jr. He did not call JFK, Mr. President, he called him dad. That's one of the most memorable images in presidential history. It's famous for lots of reasons. One, it's presidential. Two, it features a president who not long after was assassinated. But the thing that makes it so iconic is that it presents a stark contrast between the inapproachability of the most powerful office in the world and the unfettered access a child has to his father. That idea, unfettered access to a supremely important person is going to give you and me access to some important teaching about Jesus, about prayer from Jesus. What do you call, how do you relate to the most important being in the universe? Jesus said, you call him Father. Father is a deeply relational word. It immediately signals access and nearness and love and protection and provision. You keep that image of John Kennedy Jr. playing under the resolute desk in your mind. If you are a Christian, you are a child playing hide and seek under the throne of God Almighty, and it's okay because he's your father. That one idea will revolutionize your concepts of God and prayer. God is your father. Prayer is the way you have a conversation with your dad. And the word father alerts us to very, something very important about prayer. When Jesus says, our father, he's alerting us to a very important teaching about prayer. What he's telling us is that prayer is not first about getting what we want or changing God's mind or changing our circumstances or getting God to move on our behalf. Prayer is first about, first about a relationship. It's about being drawn 
into a deeper, more intimate relationship with God the Father. That phrase, by the way, our Father, is like a hyperlink to everything else the Bible teaches about the fatherhood of God. All the phrases in the Lord's Prayer, and we're going to look at several of them in the next several weeks, all the phrases are that way. Each phrase, whether it's hallowed be your name or your kingdom come, it's like you could click on, on, on one of them and it would open up an entire library of teaching about that subject in the rest of the Bible. So earlier, the worship team read for us Galatians chapter 3. I want to go back to that for a moment. Because it explodes this idea of what it means to be a child of God. It explodes this idea of what it means to have God as your father. So Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, we heard this a minute ago. In, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Two things here. First, if you are in Christ, you're a child of God, Paul says which sounds pretty exclusive. And I mean that in a bad way. Exclusive as in non-inclusive, non-including. Like Paul is saying that if you're not in Christ, if if you haven't been baptized into Christ, you are not a child of God. That's That's exactly what he's saying. He's restating something Jesus himself said in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And now we hear that, and we're like, you can't say that. That's awful. That's narrow and discriminating, and it has the stink of privilege all over it. And it would be narrow and discriminating and privileged if God limited membership in his family to only certain kinds of people. But he doesn't. A relationship with God is open to anybody. It it doesn't matter what, what sex you are, what color you are, what nationality you are, what age you are, your economic status, your educational achievement, your intellectual acumen, how much money you make, where you live, where you're from, who your family was. None of that matters. Access to a relationship with God is available to anyone in Christ. That's inclusive. The second thing here, the translation that we read and probably the one many of you are reading right now, uses the phrase in verse 26, children of God. You see that? Children of God. The Greek word in verse 26 is actually, literally, sons of God. You are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. The newer translations felt like that was too gender non-inclusive. And so they translated it as children, but, but the literal word is sons. Huios is the Greek word. The same word we use when we talk about Jesus as the Son of God. He's huios to theo. This is huios, same word, sons. And I, I think a lot of us hear that and we go, well, there you go. Especially if we're a little skeptical of, of Christianity and the Bible, there you go, the ugly head of male hegemony is rising up again, and that just proves the Bible is sexist. They said, but when the translators make this children, which is an acceptable translation, when they change it to children instead of sons, they're actually missing Paul's point. They're taking the fangs out of this passage. They're taking the scandal out of this passage, but the scandal is not what we think it is. A few verses later, and this is what Jason was mentioning when he, when he did the communion meditation. A few verses later, Paul compares our membership in the family of God to the legal concept of adoption. You, you've been adopted into the family of God, he's saying. And we're familiar with that, right? We, we, many of us have adopted children. Many of us have been adopted. We, we, we know the concept of adoption. But back then, the only people who ever got adopted were male. If a wealthy individual did not have an heir, 
He would often adopt someone into his family in order to have someone to whom to pass down his estate. But the only people who were ever adopted were boys. Girls were never adopted. They didn't get to become heirs unless they were born into the family. And so Paul intentionally uses the gender-specific word sons. What he's saying is that ladies out there in the Roman world, you would never become heirs because you would never be adopted because you're not sons. But in Christ, you can be. Which is why he goes on to say in verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are heirs. It's kind of like this. Let's see if this will give you a little handle on that. Years ago, Lisa and I kept foster kids, and we kept a bunch of them, uh, mostly babies, but on one occasion uh, for, um, I don't remember how long it was now, we, we had a couple of teenage boys from Laos, the Laotian teenagers, Vey and Kong. And it was a culturally broadening experience for everybody, okay? Uh, one of the things we noticed was that if I told Vey and Kong to do something, they would do it. They, they were very responsive. They would, they would immediately comply if I told them to do something. But if, but if I was gone or if Lisa told them to do something, they could kind of take it or leave it. If they wanted to do it, they might do it, but if they didn't want to do it, they wouldn't do it. They just, they were not very responsive to her. So after we've been dealing with this for a little while, we just decided we're going to confront this and ask them what's going on. So we said, why won't you obey Lisa the way you obey me? And they said, because she's a woman. In their cultural experience, women were not a source of authority. Only men were. So I said to them, okay, here's the thing. When I'm not here, Lisa is the man. And they were like, she's the man? And I said, yeah, she's the man. That's what Paul's doing here. He's telling Christian women and Christian slaves and Christian Gentiles, you're a son. And if you're the son, you're an heir, an heir of God. God is your father. The implications of that are staggering to think that you and I can become heirs of God, adopted into his family, and call him father. Let's say you come up with the idea for a killer app, and you risk everything you have to develop it, to market it, you quit your job, you mortgage your house, you borrow money from friends and family, you put everything on the line, and it just takes off. And then Google calls you up one day and says, we'll give you a billion dollars for it. Didn't, they just buy, didn't Google just buy Fitbit for two billion? Okay, so this is a real example. This happens. That, that would be awesome, wouldn't it? You develop the app, Google buys it from you for a billion. Wouldn't that be great? And of course, you would tithe out of that, right? You would. And then let's say that you adopt a child. What just happened to that child? She just became an heir to a fortune. A fortune she did not earn. She didn't take the risk. She didn't do the work. She did nothing. And her life is permanently changed. And it's a pure gift. So, what's God's net worth? beyond anything and everything you ever wanted. And neither you nor I earned any of it. But it's yours because God is your father. You see how important this word father is? You see how big it is? It means you have an inheritance. Friday, we lost a great man. 
Art Leslie was a great man. But he was not perfect. My brother Art Leslie was a sinner. But he put his faith and hope in Jesus Christ. And because his faith and hope were in Jesus Christ, he became a son of God. And on Friday, he received his inheritance. And right, if he could, I, I wish he could come back right now. I wish he would. So he could say, you have no idea. You got no idea what it's like. No eye hath seen, no ear has heard. It's so true. That's what he would say. You and I have access to the most important being in the universe. You and I are John Kennedy Jr. playing under the resolute desk. You and I have an unquantifiable inheritance. And because of that access and that inheritance, we get a new name. We get a new identity. Could you use a new name? Could you use a new identity? Galatians 4, 7, Paul says, you're no longer a slave. You're a son. You're a child of God. Tim Keller points out that almost every time Jesus prayed, he called God either Father or Abba. Father or Abba. Hey, you guys want to come back, back up, Lincoln? Either God, he called God either Father or Abba. And that shows up all over the, the, the Bible. There's one moment, though, when Jesus did not call God Father. And you know what that was, right? It was on the cross. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's like in that moment, he'd lost his father. And he and his father were separated. Jesus gave up his prayer so you and I could get one. He gave up his relationship with his father so that we could be adopted as sons and daughters into the family. That's what he did for you. That's what he did for me. That's how much God loves you. God loves you. This week, you take that with you. And everywhere you go, everybody you meet, realize they are loved by God as much as you are. You be a conduit of that love and a channel of that love. But more than anything, just remember that when Jesus says, our Father, he signals that prayer is about a relationship with a God who loves you. Let's stand. Let's sing. This morning we take hope and we share joy in knowing that Art Leslie has heard the words of this song in real time, How I Love You Child. When the night is falling and the day is done, I can hear you calling, come.
Let's pray. Holy Father, you are compassionate, you are abounding in love, you are faithful, and you are our Father. Right now, we claim you as our Father, and we are humbled to be considered your children. Father, move us to, to respond as your children and to, to share your love, to overflow with the love that you have so bountifully shared with us. Father, right now our hearts are sad. They're burdened with the loss of art. And we just pray that uh, we will look to you in these coming days. And we look forward to your plans, to your provisions. And we look forward to seeing how you continue his legacy. Father, just bless us as we leave this place, as we seek to serve you and to share the love that we have as your children. In Jesus' name, amen.